Dorks of Yore. All right, we ready to roll, sir? Hmm? Okay, I'll start by, usually people want to know how the hell did I end up at TSR. Charm, conniving, and luck. I met Gary over the phone late in 73. I was at, at Carbondale, uh, Southern Illinois University, and we'd had a chain mail game that day. And um, back then, with rules, when something came up. Well, how do we do this? The rules don't cover it. If you weren't playing with a, with a judge or a referee, then you agreed on a rule and you continued to play and it applied for the rest of the game. That was just the way we played because the playing was more important than the rule. So they'd always had in the back of every rule book, you know, for a question, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to. And um, so I called up long distance directory assistants and uh, asked if they had a number for everybody named Gygax in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and they did. And, and I said, okay, and I got it. And so um, I waited until Saturday night after 9 o'clock, because that's when the rates were cheapest back in the 70s. They were significantly cheaper <laughs> after 9 o'clock until about 6 or 8 p.m. on Sunday. That was the best window for cheap long distance. So when everybody called their parents on the other side of the world or whatever. So I called him up and said, hi, um, you don't know me. My name's Tim Cass. I got a chain mail question. Do you have a minute? Sure. The conversation lasted almost an hour and 40 minutes. We read the same. We found in the, in the course of, we discovered all these similarities. But the thing, I, the, the first time I noticed what Gary does when people ask him a question like that, because it's the first thing he asked me, well, what'd you do? What did you decide? And I told him, he says, well, I don't know if I'd come up with anything better than that. And he did that to lots of people over the course of his career. Uh, he would never just say, you do it this way. He'd always go, well, how did you resolve it? And so he encouraged people to think outside the box and make their own decisions. And uh, we read the same books. We, we liked the same movies. Um, it was just like, wow, it was weird. You know, like brothers separated, different mothers, you know, whatever. And so uh, the, correspond the, the friendship blossomed, the correspondence went on, and I'd call him up every, you know, once, a, once every month or two just to chat. Cause again, we had so much in common. And, uh, and I was a 22-year-old college student with a family who'd been to the war back, so you know, I didn't really have a lot of connections to make with somebody that liked the stuff I made. I, I liked. So... Um, it transpired that he started telling me about this strange game he was working on. And it was all new, and it was, it was something, you know, and even today it's not easy describing role-playing. Imagine when they didn't exist, explaining, which is why, part of why I got hired. We'll get to that. Uh, and so, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I, I decided to take my wife and daughter back up home, Moline, Illinois, from Southern Tip, and come on up to uh, Lake Geneva and go to the convention. Moron than it was, I had no idea I needed to reserve a room or anything. I got up there, there went a room within 75 miles. And I go, well, I guess I'm just going to stay until midnight when it closes and drive home. And uh, I played in a game, a pickup game, sat in the back, and had no idea why about 40 minutes later we were all had been encased in some sort of lucite stuff and cut up into little two-inch cubes for paperweights. And I was going, well, I don't know, Gary. <laughs> this didn't make a hell of a lot of sense to me you know, because it, I wasn't really understanding what was going on, and I was just kind of sitting in the back trying to pick it up. And maybe an hour later, uh, a young man who I later figured out was probably Rob Koontz, walking down the hall at the horticultural hall going, uh, we got spots for a game, we got spots for a game. So I said, well, okay, I told Gary I'd try it. So I said, okay, I'll sign up. So he handed me a dwarf character. And a couple, three hours later, 
We'd rescued this dying dwarf lord because I was the only dwarf in the party. He gave me his, his symbol of rulership, and I had 60 knights under, or 60 dwarven warriors under my command, and I was rich. And I'm sitting there going, God damn, I like this game. This is pretty cool. I don't know how it happened, but these are good results. So I had enough money to buy a set of dice or the supplement, Greyhawk, and the game. I didn't have, I was running out of money by this time. Because again, I was very naive and never been to a game convention ever. Uh, in fact, that was a mystical, magical experience in and of itself. The first time I went and realized there's more than 15 people in the world that played war games. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I decided I kind of liked it. So I went back to college down in Carbondale and I, I got a hold of my group and I said, uh, oh, I got this neat new game we're going to play in a couple of weeks. Okay, Tim, whatever. Well, seven weeks later, because it took me that long to figure out, those books, I didn't write them. They were awful. But it's really not their fault because they were aimed at miniatures players because it came out of miniatures, but it was, t it was we only wrote to miniatures players because it was the only market that understood moving and, you know, and stuff like that that wasn't gridded or squared or hexed, you know. So uh, took me about six, seven weeks. Oh, and the first dungeon was just like everybody else's first dungeon. It was like a carnival. Um, I rewrote the lyrics to Simon and Garfunkel and called it Let's Go Killing at the Zoo because you had a thing in every room and everything had treasure, you know, and there's no such thing as dungeon ecology, or any, which is an article I wrote several years later in Dragon. Um, but, you know, nobody was like that, and I'm giving away magic items like crazy. Uh, and, oh, boy, was that a man. Oh, I'll tell you, Crazy Neil. Crazy Neil was an astronomy student. Sometimes we thought it was astrology, but no, it was actually astronomy. Crazy Neil got a polymorph self amulet. Because like an idiot, I rolled on tables for every room, and wow, you know. And anyway, he never remembered his armor. He probably more been something to ruin his armor. And I'm trying to figure out, how am I going to get this thing away from him? Oh, this is killing me. It's killing me. He did it himself. He became Dragon Spam. He ran into a 10, foot, 10 by 10 foot room to get out of the arrow shower and polymorphed himself into a golden dragon. And I said, okay, Neil, hold that thought. Be quiet. And everything else is going, rah, 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 going on all this time. And uh, so they go, um, oh, what happened to Neil? And so somebody goes to open the door, and, and I said, well, before you, you see this big mass of globby, bloody, nasty flesh. It's kind of like dragon spam. And so I got it away from him. <laughs> he lost it in the We never went back and excavated that room. It was in the middle of all that decaying, nasty meat, so I got it out. Gary and I be, be, became uh, much closer at this point, and my group in Carbondale didn't know it, but they were playtesters for Gary, because we'd, we'd confer, I'd try something new, and my guys, and I'd tell Gary how it worked out, because the game was evolving, evolving, evolving uh, very fast. And at this time, I was a journalism student, and Gary, in seven, late in 74, said about how he had these plans in the future to expand, incorporate, take this strategic review, little newsletter, make it into a magazine, and uh, kind of like, yeah, what do you think about that? And I was a journalism major at the time. I said, I think that sounds pretty damn good. So I went back for my last year at college and um, went to some bunch of regents and got a specialized major. I, I minored in minor history. I had a major in uh, communications, and I told them all that someday I was going to work at a game company and publish a magazine. Now, none of those existed at the time, but they yep, yep, okay, you can do that, and signed it off. And so one year later, I stepped into the job that I had actually trained for for the last year as the company editor and also Gary's editor. And, um, you know, and that was a different thing. And so that's how I got to TSR in September of 75. Actually, um, my first two checks were tactical studies rules because the paperwork for the incorporation didn't kick in until the third week of the month. Uh, we didn't get the papers back and the new checkbooks and all that stuff. And had I known what those two checks, had I gotten them back after they were canceled, would they be worth today? Because they were all, that, that's what we did the first uh, two years, yeah, almost two years. We paid ourselves $100 a week. 
Thank God I had a wife that worked, because I couldn't have done it. Um, I got to go live a dream. You know, my wife was supportive of, you know, okay, if that's what you want to do, honey. And of course, we all thought we were going to get rich at some point, but that, that didn't work out either. Um, but that's how I ended up at TSR. I kind of, kind of charmed my way in with Gary. Uh, I prepared myself by taking some special, you know, other classes that I might not have taken. Um, I got into some, you know, marketing display stuff, and just I tried to get an all-around uh, to become a magazine editor, publisher for a magazine that didn't exist yet, and um, that's what I did. And so then, on we went. So I started in the first week, uh, first week of September. And there was um, Gary and Brian and me down the basement of his house. And we had a four by eight sheet of car, uh, plywood on two saw horses. That was our work table. That's where we assembled games. And most of what we did, they, they did that first year. Um, over 80% of their sales were reselling other people's stuff. Because we didn't have a lot of product of our own yet. A couple of three uh, miniatures rules for various periods in history. And... Um, this new weird game thing that he had yet to take off. And uh, I would work from uh, about 9 in the morning till about 1, 1 in the afternoon at Gary's. And then I would drive our one car home uh, to Delavan, which is 11 miles uh, the other side of Lake Geneva. I would drive our one car home so my wife could go work second shift at County Hospital in Elkhorn. And I did the rest of my work in the spare bedroom of the home we had in, in Delavan. That's where I created the boule. That's where I did a lot of stuff over there because I would type late into the night you know, if I was on a roll. So I, I did a lot of my work um, the first year in my uh, back bedroom in the house. And then um, eventually we got the uh, house on Main Street, moved out of Gary's basement, and the next chapter started. Now I'd rather, if you got questions, Ask them, and I'd rather just see where they take us. Oh, by the way, you're, gonna, you're at a GaryCon first. This is a pie seminar. I have a cherry pie that I can't take home with me. I'm going to eat a piece, and then a good question gets a piece of pie. Is that incentive? <laughs> and it's pretty, for, a, for a bakery pie, it's a pretty tasty pie. Um, Several years ago, Jim Ward's first medical problems happened, and he got snowed under in debt. And so um, I created the Save the Warden, and we set up Facebook things, and I raised about eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 to help Jim pay off his debts. Of course, he's been sick several times since, and he'll never get out of debt. But he told me that as long as he's able and coming, that he will bring me a pie every day at GaryCon for what I did for him. So I have a pie, and anybody else wants a pie, have, it's not bad. Help yourself. Everybody use a sugar boost on Sunday morning. So where do you want to go from here? Come on. All right. Go ahead. Shoot. I'll get you next. How did you guys start, since you had mentioned the belay, how did you start evolving the kind of creature menagerie? Good question. Good question. Uh, excellent question. Um, before D and D, nobody knew what a bugbear looked like. That was just a scarum harem word, a harem scarum word, from England. You know, just like you know, creepy crawly or or woolly buggers or whatever. And Gary's imagination just says, "Well, okay, uh, an orc must look like this," and uh, and so, and um, the mo the the majority of the monster manual was created, you know, by other other people than me. The only one I can take complete thing is the boule, and that was an accident. Um, back in those days, um, well, before computer printing, we used actual negatives for ads and stuff. <laughs> well, one of the negatives got destroyed en route, and I did not have enough time to have it sh shipped another one before I had to go to the printer. You know, they, this came in destroyed on Friday, and I was going to the printer Monday morning. So Saturday night, I'm writing along, and I, Friday I went into Gary. The Rust Monster, all those iconic early monsters were a bag of plastic monsters from Hong Kong. 
they have been pirated. I have the little boule, to use an example, in three different sizes, colored exactly the same. Every time somebody decided to make it, they'd mold off the last one. Of course, molds shrink. So you can just watch it diminish in size. So I went to Gary with a bag of monsters because I said, oh, Jesus. Well, I was going to start a creature feature the next month, which was the one that came in issue two. I already had it, but it was, I needed it in issue two. So I decided, all right, Gary, which one? And then we, we pointed the bag, and he said, well, you know, because there's only a couple left that even look, even for fantasy, like we could do something with them. He says, uh, that one's only appeared twice. And he pointed at, uh, we call it the bullet. And the only thing it had ever done is it run down the hallway and knocked everybody off their feet a couple of times. I said, okay. Now, there was a lot of anti-French sentiment pervading in the United States at this point in time. We like to mod mock everything French. So I thought, it's a bullet, huh? No, the French would call it a boule. And so it became the boule. And um, as it happened, somebody somewhere, somebody said something about dwarven pack horses being the best in the world because they could carry more and they didn't need light. And I don't know if it was an article Gary wrote or something. And all of a sudden, the world of D&D is being overrun by dwarven pack horses. So I said, I need a monster that eats horses, okay? Because that's what we would do. We would create a monster that would prey on some aspect of the game that we thought was running amok. Um, you know, too much magic? Fine, we'll go make something really hideous that homes in on magic and eats your brain. Um, you know, make, that'll make you think twice next time. Saturday Night Live was on. This was a period of time during the Jaws craze. And Saturday Night Live did Jaws takeoffs with the Candy Graham, and you'd hear the music in the background. And that night he goes, Land Shark. And it clicked, and I said, Oh shit, that's his common name. That's what happens. And you can, and, it, and then I, I did, he could, his sail was visible as he's burning along like a giant mole. It just all fell into place from stupid, disparate sources as Saturday Night Live's kept in a stupid little plastic figure. Now, Next year's plushie at Game Hole Con. It's going to be a boule. I can't wait. They sent me a little thing about, we're thinking about having a boule. And I, and I sent back a private message on Facebook. I have a little mental stiffy over that. And now that, that, I guess that's so the deal. Um, I have a great granddaughter now. She's 10 months old. And she got, the, she got a um, owl bear st uh, plushie that I brought back from there. And she loved it. And, oh, God, she loves that thing. I sent a picture of that. And they put it all over Facebook, and uh, now it's going to be a boule. And that freaks me out because it was something I created as an expediency. Probably had a duber that night or two, possibly. Um, you know, I'm in the deadline franticism going here. And I still have people come up and tell me that nothing makes them pucker like the DM saying they just found, saw a boule coming at them. They just. So, and I thought, well, if nothing else, I got a monster that makes brave men quail. I can live with that. That's what I wanted. I want something really bad. But everything I've ever created always has a weak spot. It has to. It should. Um, were any of you in my mouse game the other day? Oh, I turn people into mice. And then they go out and fight as mice against hedgehogs and weasels and stuff. And uh, um, they... Uh, Take them out of their comfort zone is what I like to do. Um, when I came back and started writing again, I just started writing stuff, and people said, nobody's ever done this before. I go, oh, maybe because I wasn't writing. I don't know. Um, that's how we made monsters. Uh, we made stuff up. Um, I did a thing in the magazine, Monster of the Month or whatever it was called, and we got some pretty good ones in there that ended up in the, you know, um, ended up in the uh, Monster Manual and stuff. And that's where they came from. Um, but that was the genius of Gary and, and um, Dave and Rob Coons, Terry Coons, who most people have no idea who he is until I say, well, he's the guy that invented the beholder. And they go, oh, <laughs> right? And Terry was a kid when he did it. He was here this weekend, and we got to sit down and catch up for a while. Um, just making stuff up. To, you know, I make stuff up now in, in the stuff I'm writing for Eldritch and for other people because, number one, I want to tell the wizards to go kiss it because I'm not going to use anything they think they own. 
And two, I don't want, I don't, I hate it when I hear somebody describe a monster and some clown at the back of the table go, oh, that's a so-and-so and he's got everything, he knows everything about it. Not when you, you might think you know everything about it, but I try to tweak them. A couple of years ago, I, at this con, somebody got up in the middle of my game and told me I was doing it wrong. <laughs> I told him, hey, if you're not having any fun, you can believe no hard feelings. He kept nattering and nattering and nattering, and then I suggested he leave. Apparently, he didn't know who I was because the rule he was arguing about, I wrote. <laughs> but I didn't point that out to him. Though I did win an argument once on Facebook. They were going back, what did this, and I can't remember what it was, it was so many years ago. And uh, I wrote, uh, no, it's this. How do you know? I wrote it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't like it. I said, I don't care. You don't have to play it that way. You asked. I wrote it. I did everything at TSR in the beginning. Um, TSR was everything in the beginning. We had miniatures rules. We sold other people's miniatures. Um, we had, uh, we did, uh, those first five years, we did a lot of board games. We couldn't sell people on the fact that we were anything but fantasy role playing. That's why we ended up eventually blending Little Wars back into Dragon Magazine. Dragon Magazine is probably the thing I'm the proudest of. And um, from the onset, before Gary even hired me, we talked about a magazine that would not be a house organ. House organ is not a bad thing, the general um, moves for the old S&T games. Now, it's not a bad thing to go into detail about your games so that people enjoy them more and whatever. Not a bad thing. But we believed that a rising tide would lift all boats, and so that our magazine was going to be about everybody's game that was fun to play. If you think back the first 39 issues, which I'm responsible for, you won't find a single column inch of negative in there. There are too many neat things to talk about, to spend, waste time on, oh, this thing sucked. You know, well, it's just in my opinion anyway. At the time, I didn't feel that I was qualified to judge anyway. Um, but, uh, we, never, we went, never went negative. We loved, both of us loved all forms of gaming. I'd been playing board games since the sixth grade with da Avalon Hills D-Day. Um, my parents got a little worried when I was 12 or 13, didn't think I was gonna leave the sandbox because I was out there blowing up army men with lady fingers. Playing, I later read, as an adult, I read Little Wars by H.G. Wells and go, yeah, that's what I was doing. I was shooting cannons and you know, I was doing the whole thing. I just didn't know that somebody had done it before. So I kind of, I've kind of enjoyed this aspect. I've always been real competitive. Uh, my mom was a gamer, so I was playing Candyland and Chinese checkers and um, Canast and stuff way before I was even eight years old. Uh, I was playing bridge with, uh, when I was eight, I was, I was fourth for bridge in my neighborhood if the fourth lady was gone that day. So I had to play bridge from like nine to noon. And uh, I learned chess and all that, but I discovered war games and it's like, oh baby. This is where it's at, because I see gaming as problem solving. And RPGs are the same. The guy on this side of the table gives you a problem. How you go about solving it is so much more infinitely variable even than a board game that you can play over and over again and try this ploy, try that ploy. Chess, you can try this opening, this gambit. I quickly grew tired of chess when I discovered war games because I devoured about 12 chess books by that point in time and memorized gambits and openings and blah, blah, blah. And no, I, I saw games and that was it. But I only played with that guy for three years. Didn't play any in high school. Got into the service, played with two guys. Came back to junior college, found three more that played. Went to Carbondale and there was 12 of them. And when I walked in that day, I thought I, I, thought I heard the angels. And then the day I went to the first Gen Con, and there's 350 gamers, I almost cried. I didn't know there were that many of us in the world. Truly, there were no magazines. You know, if you weren't in at a club and got a newsletter from the club, you had no idea what was going on out around you. Avalon Hills General did start putting a column of cons around the country that weren't just Avalon Hill. Of course, at that point in time, they were mostly Avalon Hill because they were the leading board game company. Um, now, it's funny the way those guys saw us as a threat. And uh, Gamma was formed to keep TSR out. We had to sue to get into Gamma. 
that's a game association, game, American, game manufacturers association. Uh, they wouldn't let us in. They kept black, somebody kept blackballing us. And finally, I think we decided we are gonna sue them. Oh, I've been looking for you, my friend. Oh my. Um, did you mean what you said last night? Yes. He outbid me on it. The only thing, well, the second thing I bid on the auction last night, and I thought, oh shit. He says, happy birthday, he bought them for me. All right. Go, go ahead and hit a pause here if you want, or not. I don't care. I, um, this is, this is cool. Hi, I'm, 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 fi I'm, film I'm filming a, uh, a thing right now, oh, okay. but this is, for those of you who don't know, this is my good friend Derek White, the geek preacher. He is a, uh, he's a Methodist minister. I, he goes to all the cons, almost I do. He does prayer meetings at Gen Con every Sunday morning for the gamers who wish to go. And he's just a really pretty nice guy. And today he's even neater because he gave me a present. Well, I, and we were having the charity auction, and I never try to mess with uh, Tim in an auction. Yeah, that's a joke. Cause I always <laughs> yeah, he always auction. jacks my prices up. And, and uh, Tim was, uh, so he said yesterday, I can't, bid, I can't auction things off because I want to bid on them. And so, so I handed him to Frank. Frank. Yep. And I said, oh, my, because Hans, the author, is a good friend of mine. And so I just kept bidding it. And Tim's like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. I got to stop bidding. And I said, happy birthday, Tim. Yeah, and that was touched. And here, Hans uh, uh, met me. And I said, well, he said, I've never met Tim Cask. And so I said, here. So I'm going to let Hans give Tim. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I, 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 I skimmed through them. And I thought, uh, this is something I'm going to enjoy reading. Yeah, good art. That helps. Thank you. I, I, I can no longer afford him. He got famous. <laughs> you know what? With Dragon Magazine, I must have discovered 15 guys that ended up making a hell of a lot more money than I did. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing with artists. You, you give them a break, and then they don't forget where they came from, yeah. do they? He, he did offer me a discount, but it was still... Yeah, it's still pretty still steep. Three times right Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was still pretty steep. Yeah, I'm going to look forward to reading these, and if they're as good as I think they are, I'll be talking about them. Because I'm always looking for new good fantasy authors. Excellent. And uh, once you finish Wings of Twilight, if you go to the website, Dan the Bard wrote a song about the book. Um, oh, it's a ask Dan. I'm his biggest pimp. It's a 10 minute I ballad. sell CDs for him everywhere, man. <laughs> a ballad he wrote yeah, about a this? A 10-minute ballad about Wings of Twilight. Oh, God, I can't wait. Yes, I will. I will do that, yes. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Oh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. What time are you leaving out? Oh, this is, this is supposed to be over at 2. Of course, I may run out of things to say, and they may all leave by 1. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the interruption. I appreciate that. I've been hunting for him all morning to see if that's what he really meant, that he was going to give them to me. Um, yeah, they look pretty good. And I'm, like I said, I'm always looking for a good new fantasy authors because a lot of them are very formulaic and boring. Speaking of which, if you've never read the book Orcs, do it. You will never look at orcs the same as meat sacks worth experience points. I, I kid you not, it changed the way I write adventures. How profound? For I, uh, Iron Wind Miniatures, their last Kickstarter, I wrote them an adventure as a stretch goal, and all the PCs are orcs and goblins. I, it really changed the way I look at the game. So I re that's, a, that's a book I highly recommend to all of you fantasy players, Orcs. I don't remember the author. I should probably keep that written down because I talk about it all the time. Next question. Where'd he go? Okay. All right. He was there. All right. Yes. What? Yes. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about if there were any of the growing pains that you had uh, ramping up your first magazine? Um, well, you know, the, the, okay. Um, I did... I guess I did four strategic reviews, and that was in between Blackmore and you know and 1066 and all the other games we were doing because I worked on development on everything the first three years because there was only three or four of us, <laughs> so we all did everything. Um, when we started ramping up, and um, phrase your question again. I was wondering if you had any growing pains. Well. Actually, I was blessed. This was a time of burgeoning interest in writing. People wanted to share their thoughts, and there were no markets. So I was 
The last couple issues of Strategic Review I could have made into magazines, I had so many interesting things, what we called over the transom, unsolicited material. I had a couple of magazines worth, before I even rolled out the door, waiting. I literally had a slush pile, three of them, the good stuff, the stuff that I could fix and make good, and the art. So many budding artists were looking anywhere. They didn't even care if they got paid. They just wanted their art to be seen. So I was incredibly fortunate in that regard. I had this huge slush pile of good stuff. The thing I take pride of in my years as the editor there, I made a lot of these in the middle, this quality, and nobody knows it, because I, I worked hard at keeping the author's voice. I didn't use words he wouldn't might have used or were out of context with the rest of the way he wrote. So I made a lot of those almost in the goods. I was fortunate. I had tons of stuff. As I mentioned earlier, I had guys coming to me that, please, please, please buy my art that now I can't afford. <laughs> Couldn't afford if I was rich. Um, so many guys, a lot of TSR's artists came through the Dragon. They, they worked for me first. They'd see him downtown and, you know, in the hotel and steal him from me, hire him. But, you know, I'm, I'm all good with that. Um, Tramp came through me. Um, um, or Otis came through me, D came through me, uh, Diesel came through me, I published them first. Darlene came through me, I published her first. Um, so I was very fortunate and there were a lot of very young and talented, they didn't come out right, very talented and young artists out there that were dying for exposure. Um, you all know who Janelle Jacques is, right? Yep. I hope. I didn't know it until a couple of years ago in Texas, I bought her first commercial piece and published it. And I, she had written an article, or a long, long letter to me about um, would we care or would we object if she started um, this, this fantasy magazine thing in which you know, became her, her thing. And I still have trouble with the pronouns. I first met Paul, Paul's now Janelle. Jacques is the last name. That's the important part. Um, and I didn't realize that I'd been the first one to publish her. Uh, I didn't know that I was uh, published uh, um, uh, Darlene's stuff over the express wishes of the other people. Well, I ran my own independent uh, division. I don't care who liked who down at the other building. I ran what I wanted. And so I published uh, Darlene. And Gary so loved Darlene's work that he gave her the Greyhawk maps. Probably one of the most iconic pieces of fantasy art from that period. Um, so actually, it was kind of e kind of easy. the The problem was um, at first finding the mix, but then as other guy, other companies, and I say other guys because I knew the individuals that started them. When other guys' stuff started, you know, selling and becoming uh, more popular. Then the little articles I'd been running or the tips, hey, check this out, then became, so it became actually easier as the tide took off um, because there were more people wanting to write something about their favorite game. The fanzines at that time were um, just blowing up all over the country um, because people just wanted to share their thoughts about it in the way it sh you should be playing this way. It's a lot of that. We had people tell us that, we managed the game so poorly, we should just make, today we call it open code for everybody. Give up all our rights. They actually told us that. We screwed up the game so badly, we should have no, and it's like, yeah, right, okay. That'll happen. You know, it's like when the religious people uh, started attacking us. The first book burning we knew of was a little, little church up in Minnesota, one of those Holy Son of the Lamb of God, you know, real little splinter way out there. Um, and I do not mock religion per se, but they were extremists. And they gathered, they got all their kids' horrible demonology books and devil worship, and, blah, 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 blah. and they piled them all up in the middle of their parking lot, their brand new asphalt parking lot. And they brought out a D8 dozer to run over them and tear up their entire parking lot. <laughs> Cost them twelve thousand dollars to redo their parking lot. <laughs> yeah, God was watching. Um, Brian came in, and somebody had sent me a little news clip of this. 
because um, for a long time my job was going through the oddball mail and answering it. Uh, <laughs> Brian sent me a little clip, and so I read it, and 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 Brian's first first words out of his mouth: "Who's the distributor up there? Double their order!" And by God, they did. Because all those kids went out and bought their books back, and all the other kids bought one too. Which proves there's no such thing as bad publicity. Make it forbidden, and everybody wants it. The greatest case in point was the steam tunnels in Michigan. Dallas Egbert III. Now, I knew Dallas before all this happened. Dallas was a very brilliant, unbalanced young man. Too brilliant for his own good, whatever. This is many, many years ago, and we didn't know how to recognize. Um, so brilliant that he skipped several years of school and entered the University of Michigan at 15. Michigan or Michigan State, whichever one it was. At 15. Because he was the last kid, and his parents were basically, ha, ah, no more kids. Case in point, he came home one Thanksgiving, had to break a basement window to crawl into the basement to get into his family home because they hadn't told him they'd be in Europe for Thanksgiving. Very troubled, very troubled. I'd, I'd met him at a previous convention up there, and I remembered him because this 15-year-old kid was, you know, he had flashes of brilliance. So he disappears. And that really started the whole hysteria because they hired this jerk-off. Now I gotta, I gotta remember I'm being taped. Um, they, they hired this detective who was the biggest sack of cow crap that ever came out of Texas. And he was convinced that he was wandering lost and possibly dead in the steam tunnels under the university. Because somebody said once in somebody's hearing that some people apparently went down there and explored through them. Didn't say they were players or anything like that, just some people. So he leaped to, oh shit, they're playing D&D &D in the steam tunnels, and he's lost and dying, poor lad. And, oh, it just, it spiraled out of control. And that's when they lit the fuse on the rocket and the game took off. Because everybody wanted to know. The stupid 60 minutes crap didn't hurt. The people that already thought we were demon worshipers weren't gonna change their minds. Uh, I don't think they convinced any neutral people that we were. Um, no such thing as bad publicity. They were so convinced that Dallas was in the tunnels that they pulled the three bulletin boards out of his dorm room and state police drove them down to Lake Geneva overnight. Because I came in that morning and there's a cop parked in the street. First, my first thought was, same thing in the car? No, okay. Um, there's a cop at the door. So I get in there and I am asking, hey Gary, what's a cop out here for? You know, because we're all pretty long hair at Bell Bottoms, you know, the whole nine yards. We're, it's, it's hippie period here. And, uh, oh, hope you don't have anything important to do today. Well, when the boss says, hey, yo, what do you say? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, if the printer isn't coming, you're right. So um, we had the three bulletin boards. They brought them down to us. They would boxed them so that they wouldn't be jostled because they wanted us to interpret the positions of the thumbtacks staples and pins, they were sure there was a code in there somewhere. And I looked at Gary, I said, are you shitting me? No, no, they really mean it. Okay, so I dumped my stuff in my office, came around next door to Gary's office, and we spent the entire day, one at a time, with us across the room. We had gone down to the library and sweet-talked the librarian into a couple of reference atlases that normally never left the building down to the office. We'd sit there, okay. No, I don't see anything. No, I don't see anything. You see anything yet? No, I don't see anything. Get to the end. Turn it 90 degrees. <laughs> we spent nine hours <laughs> looking at those stupid ports. <laughs> Nothing was there. Nothing. They even gave us big blown up maps of the campus and that to see if it was a camp. No. When the poor kid was found later and he wasn't harmed or anything, it's just where he stuck him back in when he took down his papers. But they were convinced he's lost the steam tunnel and this is the clue. We'll find him with this clue. That was in the level of hysteria, but it just, pew, sales took off. We doubled our next print runs and 
doubled them again in half the time that an old print run would have taken, and there it went. And all because a, a troubled young man had just kind of dropped out, gone and stayed with a, uh, he was questioning his sexuality, he was, you know, he, like I said, he was a troubled young man. And so he'd gone and just decided to get his head together and moved in with a couple of uh, lesbian friends of his and just didn't have any idea all the shit was going on out around him. Didn't realize he was missing. Not completely clueless. And then, of course, unfortunately, a couple of years later, he ended up killing himself. So, terrible story. But uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity when, we, when this kind of stuff happens. It was crazy. Um, we finally decided how to tell people what we did during this period of time. And I think I can take credit for this because I was dealing with yet another reporter because uh, Gary did them for a few days and passed it on to Brian. Brian did it for a day and dumped it on me. Pardon me. Oh, it's a, it's a text. Okay. Um, the, Brian dumped it on me, so I ended up handling the media for a long period of this time. And I had a woman say, you know, very earnest young lady, well, what exactly is it? How do you do this? And she was the first one, believe it or not, that asked questions about the game or the mechanic or anything. And so it, it came to me in one of those inspired moments you can't really take credit for. When I explained, I said, look, the dungeon master is the author and he outlines a plot. The players fill in all the dialogue and mark where the chapters are. Click, I, writer to writer, she understood it. And I was so proud of that after she left, I went over to Gary, I said, Gary, here's what we tell people from now on. And that became the TSR line. We write the plot, we give you the title, you fill in the details. And if we don't like it, we won't let you. That, that got added on sort of afterwards. But we had finally figured out a way to explain what this stuff was. Because we didn't really know. We just loved it and did it. But it was so different than anything that come before. Because it was virtually limitless. Board game, you were limited to the board, the counter mix, the hexes. Miniatures game, you're limited to the table sand table, whatever, the troops you have, and as long as they live. And you can only do certain things with them. Fantasy, you can do anything. Learn to fly. You know, find the right magic, you can fly. You know, you can do anything. Um, some of it got really strange in those first years. Really strange, which is, which is what prompted us to put out the Eldritch Wizardry and the Gods, Demigods, and Heroes supplements. We were trying to rein in some of the more bizarre aspects of the game because we felt, at the time, very protective of our baby. Um, it was our game that we were sharing with the world, but we really would get upset when people were what we, doing what we thought were abusing it. Case in point, don't know why, somehow, a bunch of people on the East Coast got obsessed with girdles, you know, girdle of giant strength, girdle of whatever. And alarms and excursions and a couple of other fanzines started, they started obsessing about these things. And when it got to girdles of sex change, girdles of orientation, or both, hi, guy, put it on, you're a girl that likes girls. Um, you know, it's, oh, no, man, no mom's going to buy her kid this this, this game. So we started trying, we realized we had to kind of quash some of those things um, by our disapproval. We would uh, very, in an almost British fashion, disapprove. <laughs> and would kill it sometimes. Spell points. There was a period of time when everybody wanted to use spell points. We saw it as a game wrecker. I still see it as a game wrecker. So we came out vehemently against it and quashed it. There were th those kinds of things that we just would speak against, write against, lecture against, whatever, because we, we didn't have the hubris to say, everybody needs to play the game our way. We did have the hubris to say, some of you are playing it in a way we'd rather you didn't. Um, because again, we were very image conscious. Um, and uh, rightfully so, I, th I believe. So uh, we would address things. I got an honest-to-God letter. I was, I was on letter duty that week, that month, whatever. 
And I, I, I was on the, when I opened the book, opened the letters for the answer questions. You know, I hated that. I'd wait till I got half a bushel basket, literally take it home on a weekend and s spend a weekend blitzed answering stupid, le stupid questions. And um, we got a letter. I read it on a Monday morning uh, from this DM who was just at a complete and total loss of what he was going to do next for his group. Why? Well, last session, it seems they'd gone to Valhalla, killed Odin, killed Thor, wiped out the Valar, destroyed the Bi Bifrost Bridge, and really put a hurt on Fafnir, the, you know, the great snake, or Yoskrill, the great snake. When we got up from the floor from laughing, and I don't think I've ever seen Brian laugh that hard, because Brian really wasn't a fantasy guy to begin with, we got up the floor from laughing, and it's like, oh shit, this is getting out of hand. This, in this, we started to address level creep. When we played, you got a guy to 10th level, 10th level, we retired him. Went and built a keep, carved it out of the wilderness, hired men at arms, lived a good life, started a new character. We always had five or six characters active at a time. Now one of them might be laid up, because you know, in Lake Geneva we played those stupid healing rates. But uh, you know, so you, you know, somebody's going, I'm having an adventure on Thursday, where? Okay, what part of the, the geography? And see, so you'd look and say, oh, I could bring him or I could bring him. So we didn't have our whole lives invested in a character. We didn't go into a clinical depression when our characters died. And it was like, oh, fine, give me a sheet. And you walk around the corner and there's your brother Bob. And so the game went on and your brother Bob was, was now who you were playing. And we went on. We didn't invest in a lot of that. Uh, Tenth level character was, was badass. Now we're damn people who are 19th level and all this stuff. So that's why in Eldritch and that, you see these real high levels of how many points it takes. We tried to make it even harder. We, you know, we jacked the points up into eight, eight and nine digits. And um, because, number one, we never figured it would happen. We thought everybody, in our, again, in our hubris, we thought everybody would be happy to retire at 10 and start again because we all enjoyed the struggle to get there, not the wielding the power and the um, peeing contests that came from that. You know, we didn't, that wasn't where we were at. That's one we misread badly, but it worked out okay. Nowadays, you know, 19 level paladin works for so-and-so, and it's like, what's the fun in that? I mean, it's like going in the woods with um, an AK deer hunting and four magazines. What's the fun? You know, sit in a tree and then <laughs> spray it with a machine gun. What's the fun? Gary hated, you know, wrong word, Gary hated the idea of a campaign run by wizards, which is why wizards are as, as weak as they are. Because if they weren't, they would run the campaign. Give that guy one wand and now you're doing whatever he tells you. And human nature being what it is, the <laughs> campaigns would end up in the toilet. So he made wizards week. Gary could not get his head around, literally, could not embrace the concept of why anybody would wish to play anything but a human superhero. Because that was Gary's ideal, all growing up and ever, you know, the mighty Gary, you know, all that. That was his thing. He simply could not understand why anybody would want to be Gandalf or Saruman or, you know, the only the only uh, tropes we had to compare to, why anybody would wish to do that? Why wouldn't they want to be Conan or, you know, uh, whatever? And so that's why it was skewed the way it was in the beginning, especially with, with Greyhawk, it skewed it. And that's why, that was his ideal being presented. We, 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 we modified that some over subsequent um, uh, supplements and then uh, when uh, Basic and Advanced came out, we kind of codified it, but uh, that was just toward the end of my, uh, my run. Did that answer? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Anybody? Next, yes. Yeah, I promise you, yes. Uh, first of all, kudos on Tygax Magazine. That was a wonderful publication. It was, but it's dead. A lot of us are very sorry to see it go in the circumstances under which it did. What? I digress. Um, <laughs> Did you participate in the hand assembly of those early editions, the brown box? And all that? No, that was Gary's kids. <laughs> uh, but, boy, when that damn dungeon board came out, I sure put together a hell of a lot of those damn things. 
um, because we were still getting peace printing. Um, shortly after that, we started um, jobbing out to people that would assemble and give it back to us assembled. Uh, um, but yeah, you ask any of Gary's children, they, 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 it, Gary had this big, long, lovely uh, dining room table. He needed it to see his family around it. And uh, there would be, they'd go lay out brown boxes all the way around the table, empty brown boxes. Come here, Heidi. Give her a bunch of number threes. Come here, Cindy. Come here. And they go around. And that's how the original games were assembled. And uh, later on, oh, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, excuse me, I assembled a lot of things. Um, again, there was, you know, three of us, and then Dave Sutherland came along and made four. And um, Dave was so art-oriented that he didn't participate in a lot of that other uh, grunt work that we did. But that was okay because he was our only artist, and we had him working like a, like a madman. Um, so he never really participated a lot in that. And... Uh, I, I, I broke a bunch of the Akam's people's hearts. The Akam is a, um, a very deep pocket collecting group that if you've got a, an old D&D product and one of them looks at it, they'll grade it for you. I mean, they're, they're, they're fanatics about it. They, they, they differentiate printings by the staples. I mean, they know their stuff. Well, we had a dinner a few years back, and I broke their hearts when I pointed out that assembling games was haphazard to say the least after the first edition first printing you know the, OD, the original D, D first printing there's no guarantee that there's a pure version anywhere because back in those days printer if you ordered 2000 you could get anywhere from 1800 to 2200 and it was okay because you knew the next one they always ran more you know set aside more stock for spoilage because, you know, you know, those 10 didn't make it through that, that run in the color, whatever. So we always had stuff for spoilage. So we'd order two, you know, order 1,000, get somewhere between 9 and 1,100. Well, after a while, those, you know, we'd order some more. Those boxes would get shuffled around, particularly when they're in the basement of the, um, ho the first hobby shop. Those boxes would get shuffled around. And we'd get an order. Oh, got to have, uh, you know, 80 sets. So... We'd go down the basement, find a box of book one, find a box of book two, find a box of box three, and wherever they were, we didn't give a damn if they were all first printing, second printing. They could have been three different printings. They were product. That's all we looked at, product. Assurances that our $100 checks were going to clear the bank, right? We didn't care. Case in point, we had a huge box of the old reference sheets from the first printing. They were much prettier than all the other ones. I think they went in with the fourth printing stuff because we found them in the back. And Brian saw it and said, product! And frankly, we were not looking at a legacy. I did not think I'd be sitting here today talking to people that were interested about how we filled boxes and stuff. Because I was, no, and I'm not belittling you. I, I'm not, I'm not. Please, please don't, please don't misunderstand. But who the hell sits around thinking that someday, um, I certainly didn't sit around thinking that someday people would send me airline tickets and give me hotel rooms to fly around the country and play games with strangers. Some days it's real good to be Tim. <laughs> Some days. Not the arthritis days, not the other days, but those days are good. So we weren't looking for to, at posterity. We weren't looking, we were looking at the checks clearing. We were looking at having enough in the account to pay for the next print run. We didn't see that. If I had those two $100 checks from Tactical Studies Rules today, the cancel checks, I could probably get a grand each for them. At least. And that's better than inflation. <laughs> Who knew? If we had them, we threw them out. Who knew? We didn't know. Um, we just knew we were having a hell of a good time, scraping by, and... Posterity, you know, devil take the hindmost. Uh, that would have been hubris in 1977 to say we're going to create a legacy. The 40 years later, people are going to talk about it. that. Would have been hubris. It would have shown in our work, and we'd have <laughs> on the toilet, just like that. We're just some guys having fun. Happened to be doing this neat new thing, 
And, I mean, to me, I couldn't have asked for a better job coming out of college. I tailored my major for it and stepped right into it. I couldn't have asked for a better opportunity. Now, the political crap and the stock and all that stuff that came later, well, that's with all successful growing businesses. Once there's money, the sharks come out, just like the blood in the water. But uh, we weren't cognizant of being icons 40 years later. That, that would have been, you know, that would have put us up in the Trump class. <laughs> Question. Yeah. All right, I'm going to get my friend here. And if he asks me anything awful, I'm going to ask one of you big guys to go back and whack him. Most everyone knows you as the first editor for Blackmore. Oh, uh, yeah. And then that's what it says in the brochure. Yeah, 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 I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, I started with Blackmore. They gave me a bushel basket full of notes, some in handwritten, some, some in... Uh, Who ultimately had to say what went into the... Me. From that day forward, I went, I, I, it was me that put stuff in. Now... Gary, Gary, no, Arneson, Arneson didn't want to be bothered. He couldn't be bothered to clean up his notes. Here. That's just the way he behaved back then. And I'm not going to knock dead guys today, but that's simply the way it was back then. He couldn't be bothered to do it. And it was, so it was my first test. And I made Blackmore. And then he's been very public before he died that he didn't care for it. To which I respond, I don't care. Gary liked it. Now, other supplements, the psionics, I take credit for that, or the blame, as your case may be. But Gary and I worked on Tinkered and, because we're both great fans of uh, Dr. Strange and the Silver Thread, and you see all that stuff in there. And so we, wanted, we, we realized that mind flares and that were like nuclear weapons. There was no defense. So we thought, well... Well, maybe there's a few people in the population that might have these mind-bending powers. Well, DM seemed to think that they ought to have at least one in every campaign. That wasn't the point. But it, and I, that I collaborated with him. Um, sometimes I'd let him read it, a manuscript, but I don't think he ever said no. Um, he hired me because he trusted me because we'd read all the same books. We'd come from the same you know, historical interest in that. And so, and he hired me as his editor. I didn't just edit books. I edited important letters for him uh, that were, you know, trying to get us in our foot in the door and that. I edited some of his personal correspondence for him. You know, it was an important letter uh, to some other company guy. That's what I was hired to do. And uh, that's why today when people go, oh, you did this and you go, that, yeah, well, that, that's why they hired me. Now, the fact that I happened to get the chance to work on something so amazing as D&D, &D, again, that's a luck factor. Um, I, I consider myself a good writer, and I consider myself a good editor, so I probably could have done it somewhere else. The fact that I could go do it somewhere that I loved was just luck. That, that was just, that was luck. But it's also the fact that in 74 I saw the chance, and I started cultivating Gary, and you know, encouraging him in his dreams and telling him I'd help share him so that when I did get out, I stepped into that. So I, I maneuvered myself into that a little bit. Um, it's recently come to light because I never bothered to talk about it, and this is along the fact that this is what I was hired to do. I midwifed AD&D. Gary and I decided what would be basic and what would be advanced. In seven days, literally locked in his office, only calls we would take were our wives. We weren't idiots. Um, so, if, and, and literally, we were not interrupted for an entire week and the next two days. And when we were done, that was basic, and that manuscript was the other. Um, nobody ever asked me before. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm like the, the, the co-obstetrician. I midwifed it. Um, I didn't brag about it because that's why I was hired. I was hired to be the editor. Gary and I had a very interesting rapport. Frank Menser kind of filled my, my spot as a sounding board for Gary after I left because he was coming in just as I was going out. And um, 
he kind of became uh, Gary's sounding board and 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 um, amanuensis as much as I was there for a while, and uh, it was it was um, it's what I did. You know, I'm I'm glad people think we did it well, but I I wasn't the visionary. I, I just I, I do certain things well, and um, we do certain things well. We did certain things well together, and like. He had stolen. I came in on a Monday, and he had taken every damn corkboard in the building down. We came in, and it's like got voids on the walls everywhere. And like, what in the hell? Somebody come in and steal our corkboards? And we go upstairs where the offices were. Gary's up there with a hammer and eight penny nails. Bam, bam, boom, bam, bam, boom. Driving nails into the pla lath and plaster walls to cover his office with bulletin boards. He had a pile of eight books, eight, eight boxes, and we were in the white box by now, and all the supplements, and we cut up eight sets of boxes, box sets and supplements, making notes on them, sticking them on this board, making notes on them, sticking them on that board. And when I tell people, the collectors now, that we car we carved up eight old sets, their eyes just glass over. <laughs> and I go, well, I just, now you know why they're so valuable. We did, They were product. You know, we didn't... We didn't I mean, I'm sure we didn't go see which which editions or which printings we were cutting up. We just went and cut up some books. Um, so I did that, and the only thing I can say that I won is the magic missile always hits for one to three points of damage. And it took me two and a half weeks to argue with me to that. Because <laughs> I kept telling him, damn it, it's the only thing a little guy gets, and if it's hit or miss, he's dead. Well, that was Gary's anti-magic user bias. That's the only argument. That and the fact that it took him two and a half years before he quit punning me. I'm not a pun fan. Gary loved them, and I would just ignore them. And to be honest, probably a few of them went over my head. And it, after two and a half years, he, he th literally threw his hands up. And he says, that's it, Tim. I'm done with it. I go, oh, shit, what did I do? He says, two and a half years, you've not risen to the bait one time. I'm not going to pun on you anymore. And I said, oh, thank you, baby Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, baby Jesus. Aha. Took two and a half years to break him. Anybody want some pie? This is really quite good pie. Have some pie, please. I don't want to throw away a pie. Um, did that answer the last question? I know it's easy for me to get sidetracked to here today. Next, anything? Well. Yeah. Um, you said that in the early days you were discovering a lot of the artists. What were you looking for? In art, like stuff what, I liked. Well, what made good? What did you? What made something that you consider to be good D and D art? I don't know. What makes you go to a museum and like this picture and not like that? That was purely my visceral response. Before I got there, they had a guy named Bell did a lot of the illustrations in the first three books. It was years later we found out that the little bastard had been copying them out of comics <laughs> and just changing the weapons and the helmets. <laughs> Okay, but it looked good, you know, and that's why that's why you see all those uh, changes in the reprints, the later reprints of the three brown books, is because we'd come, we'd gotten hip. Um, I published a couple of ab you'd have to call them abstract covers, because it came in over the transom and then it hit me. Um, for the same reason that I published some of the fiction I did, I liked it. And I thought everybody can use ideas to steal. People hated the fiction when I first started running it, thought I was wasting space. After a while, was when they quit running fiction, why did you quit running the fiction? You know, that was well after I left. But uh, I picked art on what I liked. Very often, I'd go to the slush pile to find something Greek looking or something Celtic looking because I had an article that needed a piece of art to relieve the black lines. Uh, and, you know, I'd, couldn't ask Dave Sutherland for everything, and Tramp wasn't there yet. Um, but uh, if I liked it, I ran it. I never, Gary never came and said, here, run this art or article, unless it was his, and that was the understanding anyway. Of course, he's the publisher. I'd edit it, and I'd run it for him. But he never came and said, oh, here, use this artist, use that guy. Um, and, the, and by the same token, I didn't realize that they had told Darlene that they would never use a female artist when I got to know her and started using her art because I liked it. Only that later did I find out that, ooh, there are people downtown that didn't like the fact I did that. Well, my response was, ah, I run my division myself. 
You know, I Gary gave me almost complete autonomy. The only thing I had to be responsible for was my budget. I mean, if I wanted to run an article, I ran it. Um, when I decided to do the Tom Wom games, um, I did it because at the time, uh, S and T was prancing around and we're special. We've been at a game, and I went to Tom. I know Tom from college. I went to Tom and said, "Tom, let's stick one up." s and T's nose. Let's show them that anybody can print a game in a magazine. No, snits. Snits revenge. Awful green things. Those were our thumbing our, that was us thumbing our nose at s and So selling that anybody can do this. Come on, you're not so special. Big deal. And they were neat games. I still like to play awful green things. And I hope every time that the area weapon is the fire extinguisher. Because <laughs> anything else, you're, you're, you're doomed. Um, I still play a lot of Tom Wom games, too. Oh, oh, that was a mic. Did I cover it? Um, well, I, I lost the train on that one. I can stand on the station and wait for it to come through again, or you can tell me what, what you want to know next. Art, yeah, that's right. I, used, I did a very abstract one early on. It was like in the first 12 or 14 issues that I saw a, a, a very artsy-fartsy dragon in. Now, I later found out probably 70% of the people that bought it didn't see it. But about three out of 10 would go, ah, oh, man, neat. Oh, I saw the dragon, you know, that type of thing. I liked it. I gave a lot of artists, you know, Tom Canty and several other people, um, they were on Dragon First. And they weren't very good compared to what they later did, but they were good for what I, the best that I had available. And sometimes that was the criteria. What's the best one I've got? You know, whatever. After I'd done, I don't know, maybe eight magazines. And you got to remember that every other month, these were, this was a bi-monthly the first year, and I was doing Little Wars on the off months, which I actually loved more than The Dragon at first because I'm basically a historical gamer at heart. I still am. Um, we would, uh, I, if I like, well, I lost the train again. i got to quit digressing. Ah. Sorry. Thursday, Sunday's not a good day to do these. <laughs> My brain is so squeezed like a sponge by now. Um, where were we? I'm sorry. <laughs> the next All right. Whoever's good. Here. Good. Who's got another? Yes. Tell us what you're, what you're into now. I mean, I, I know you got a new board game you're liking that we played yesterday. But oh, yeah. That, now. Well, this is supposed to be about the first five years. Oh. I'm not going to. I'd rather not sit here and. Use the time to sell myself. Um, let's see. Fun we used to have. Oh, God. Gary would run the most amazing play tests. Amazing play tests. When we started play testing MA, Marmorsis Alpha, I swear to you, it was like three weeks of a Margaret Mead expedition to visit the savages in the jungle. It took us three sessions to figure out those was neatly packed, st uh, stacked piles of wood over in the corner was a staircase. Where ignorant savages come in from the veldt, finding buildings and buttons and knobs and that. I mean, and Gary was, oh, God, he was good at that. Uh, two of us nearly blinded ourselves with the shiny metal, the shiny metal rock that was a flashlight. And, of course, two of us put it up to the wrong end and turned it on. <laughs> um, he was great at that kind of stuff. We play tested. Oh, in the early days, probably at least one night during the week. Wednesday nights was often the playtest night. Uh, if you've ever played the village of Hamlet, I'm Jeru, the Druid of the Grove. And on the nights that I didn't show up, they made dirty song lyrics up about Tim the Lusty Druid. And I understand they were up to 12 or 14 stanzas at one time. And uh, then, of course, when I did show up, they had to sing them all from the very beginning. And so I had to sit there and listen. Apparently, my character never met anything he didn't want to get together with. <laughs> Apparently, according to them, I spread myself very thinly throughout all of the flora and fauna of the forest. Um, a few years ago, I, I auctioned off uh, Jeru's staff. Um, I, the last year we were at Hort Hall, somebody left this gorgeous, beautiful walking staff big root ball up at the top that was kind of gnarly, like you could have put something in there if you wanted and whatever. And we waited a whole year, you know, and kept it. 
Nobody claimed it. We put it up in the front. Did you leave this? You know, I mean, we used to be so overly over the top honest back then, and nobody claimed it. So Tim took it home. And then when we moved to the to the gray house on Main Street, that was in the corner of my office the whole time I was there. And again, half expecting somebody to say, "Hey, did you ever find?" Because it looked like it was a unique piece of wood. So um, that became Jeru- that's where the, the again stealing ideas from God knows where. That's how he became Drew of the Oak Staff of the, of the Ash Staff. Is because of that stick sticking up in the corner in my in my office. We, that's where we mine for ideas. The device of Qualish, that um, crawdad looking thing. The yeah, the apparatus. Thank you. I didn't invent that. Qualish is the name of the wizard that was the central bad guy in the campaign in Quarbendale. We would make stuff up and then sit there and try to come up with names for it. And Brian walked in one day and says, I got this really neat mechanical thing. What was the name of that wizard? The ran- they, they, everybody was afraid of him. I said, Qualish. He goes, okay, thanks. And I'm, I get the manuscript <laughs> and there it is. We have tons of Easter eggs, what now are called Easter eggs, in our old games. Sort of cast, that's kind of uh, uh, Luco, L U L U E K dash O. That's Luke, who played as a five year old in those games, and he was just what you'd expect, like a hyperactive elf. And so Luco did some amazing stuff. Um, lots of the early stuff is named after his kids, because quite frankly, after a while, it gets hard to come up with names that don't sound artificial to you, so you might as well go for a giggle. And so we did a lot of giggling, and a lot. There's a lot of stuff in there, and so so much of it that somebody will come up with one, and I'll go, "Oh yeah, <laughs> hey, yeah, we did do that. Okay, this is so long ago." Um, but names are hard. When I'm writing now, it's it's hard to come up with names. Uh, very often, what I do to come up with names is I'll close my eyes and look at a portion of my desk, and find a couple of syllables or a couple of phonemes that click together and make up a name like that. I can't go to name generators and that because, I don't know, it's a quirk. Glad to hear you say that because my players like to, every single thing that comes into the game, they're like, oh, what's your name? Making me have to come up with names on the fly and pretty soon. Well, there's some great generators out there that you can just print them off and pick one at random just to shut them up. But when I'm writing writing an adventure for publication, um, I very often put sneaky stuff in. Um, there's a, a, a young friend of mine whose son is named Marin. Well, when I got my arm twisted to write a short story for an anthology, I named the protagonist Marin. So someday when he's old enough, his dad can say, oh, this is my, my friend Tim wrote this and gave me, this is, you know, your name. Um, I, the oh, lady's only thing, the chief protagonist is, uh, shares the same name with my 10-month-old great-granddaughter and I intend to publish it. So that's my way of making her immortal. Uh, I, d- I do those kind of eggs uh, frequently. Uh, just my, I know. It's like uh, my GPS, I've got Dennis Hopper's voice. It's hilarious. But if I erase it and go with somebody else, Dennis will be dead because he is dead. But I still have Dennis in my GPS. Well, my daughter, my great granddaughter will be in this book. My friend's son will be in that book. My buddy will be in this book. Uh, the the protagonist in a um, uh, thing I wrote for Total Confusion where five of us get together each year and we pick a weird topic and work it into our adventures and we all run different systems. And this last year was Fifty Shades of Pork. And um, yeah, that was, might be interesting. Yeah, you, you, it's about as interesting as you think it was. <laughs> and um, so the protagonist in that, I gave the nickname of my our best buddy from when we when. Uh, he and I went to college together, and um, in fact, he shared a house with my wife and I one year at college, and so uh, I stuck his old nickname in there as the stupid bad guy. Mark will probably never ever see that I named somebody Zarkon, but I did, and so to me it was funny. It was a name that popped into my head, and um, so, okay, my friend Mark is immortalized with Zarkon there forever. Yeah, that's, I can do that. It's kind of neat. My granddaughter's immortalized in there. I, I do have a, a, an, an advantage that most people don't. You know, I can't go around chiseling her name on monuments, but I can put her name in my, my writings. Five years, come on, we did a lot more. Yes. 
I don't care if it's only the same two guys. I'm here. So <laughs> you sit there and just listen. I mean, if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. Yes. Ted, do you have any recollections? You talk about you know you and Gary going back and forth about the magic missile, for instance. Do you have any recollections about what your process was in terms of coming to a conclusion together or developing something together? Well, some it, a, a surprising number of times it was a. Uh, what do you think about? Yeah, I like it. Independently. So not often did we contest. Magic Missile was a contest, okay? And I finally won him over and I said, listen, that poor son of a gun can't do anything. At least let him light a trash bucket or go knock off that ogre with one hit point left. Let him contribute to the party. And so he finally gave in and said, okay. That's the only thing I can tell you, I won. We didn't really disagree that often. Um, after that midwifing process, I went away from the writing end uh, and D&D. &D. I was way plenty busy enough with periodicals division and the magazines and all of the merchandising we were doing and the best ofs and all that kind of stuff. I was plenty busy there. Didn't need to go anywhere else. Um, and the, o the only thing I did after that is when, and I've, I've told my, Mike this, so I'm not talking on turn. We decided to take a chance on Mike Carr editing. Now, Mike Carr is a brilliant individual. At 16 years old, he created Fight in the Skies, which I still think is the best one-to-one -one flying game for the First World War. And I have literally played to them all. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. So he said, well, let's, let's uh, you know, I asked him, I said, who are you going to have edit it? Because I knew I wasn't. Because I knew once we were done, that would be it. I was basically divorcing from that side, from TSR Hobbies, and going to TSR Periodicals. And he said, well, let's give it to Mike. And, I, and we talked about it. I said, okay. Well, Mike was supposed to turn it in on a Friday. Came in with it on a Thursday. So Gary, on Friday morning, before Mike comes in, he says, uh, here. And he hands me the manuscript, you know, because we did them in these big boxes. And I said, what's this? He says, well, tell me how Mike did, but don't, don't let him know. Well, I felt kind of, you know, kind of shifty, shady. But on the other hand, I understood that we were placing a lot of trust in our next big step forward. So I went home that weekend and read the thing. You know, I had stuff planned, but it took several hours to read it. And he did a wonderful job. And I went back on Monday morning and slipped it to Gary before Mike came in. I said, it's great. I said, we got nothing problem. He says, good. He says, you're free to go. And so I went to periodicals, and that was that. And Mike did a marvelous job. It's just two years ago I told Mike I did that because I was kind of always ashamed of it. But the boss told me to. And he was actually glad to hear that. He was glad to know the story. Uh, he says, oh, I had no idea. He says, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, and then he th I guess he thought it was cool that I gave him the stamp. I don't know. But, uh, again, it's stuff we didn't talk about because it was our job. You know, Mike's got his name on the tagline. Uh, I'm, I'm in there somewhere in the thanks, but I know how much I did of it, and I know how much, in comparison to the rest of those people in the thanks, did with it, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I have an ego, but I have learned to control it. I've learned to spend it more wisely. I'm secure in the fact that I helped Gary and Dave change society, much for the better, I think. About 78, Gary and I were having one of what we called blue sky, and this kind of relates to your last question. Once in a while, when we found we had the time, we'd go into his study, pour a little scotch, light of lousy cigars that he liked, and we'd just sit and we'd bullshit. And God knows I got less and less frequent as time went on because we didn't have it. But we sat in there one day, sipping our scotch, and you know, and uh, we came to the conclusion. And when I say we came, that was kind of the way Gary and I talked. We'd finish each other's sentences and know where we were the next guy, where the guy was going next. We came out of there knowing that by God, if we had not done anything else, accomplished nothing else in the world, we had given socially uncomfortable people a menu, a venue, a method of learning to express themselves because it was mostly geeks and nerds that started playing. Since that time, I cannot tell you 
how many people have stopped me in the halls at various cons and that and said those words. I was socially awkward. I was shy. I was whatever. And I went to a wizard's party a few years ago at Gen Con, and this young man came up, and he started telling me the story. And here's a story from the old days. Worst thing we had to do going to cons was listen to everybody's last adventure. Oh, my God. I got to tell you about the time. Oh, no, please don't. But please buy the book, you know. That was, a, oh, God, we paid, we paid a price having to listen to everybody's last adventure. I still hate it to this day. I'm sorry. I've just had to listen to too many other adventures that I had no context to, no nothing, just this incident. <laughs> That's what we had to do when we went to shows, listen to everybody talk about their last adventure. <laughs> but we, again, this guy came up and said, oh, I was socially awkward and I, I, you know, I got good grades and people thought I was a geek and then I started playing D&D &D when I was 14 and now he's a senior in high school and he's vice president of his class and he's singing in a rock band and he says, I got more girls interested in me than I ever thought I would when I was 12 and dreaming. <laughs> you know? And it's because he found himself. And we created something that has enabled hundreds of thousands of people to learn something new about themselves. Even if they didn't like it, and don't do it again, whatever, they learned something about themselves. We knew at that time that, yes, this is something we had done. And we, one of the very rare occasions where we patted each other on the back, very rare. We, we very seldom did that kind of stuff at TSR. We were just afraid the bubble was going to burst and the rocket was going to run out of fuel. So we weren't looking back. We were hanging under that rocket and seeing where it was going to take us. Um, I get that story a lot. Either two variations. Oh, all the trouble that I didn't get into those two summers or, you know, the, the, the voice I found, you know, whatever. I wrote a, I, I published a, tongue-in-cheek letter to J.K. Rowling a few years back when she'd been declared richer than the queen, you know, billion, you know, and I, I wrote back to her that I said, you know, here's the deal. We cut down the trees and we pulled the stumps and we planted those first crops, small fields, say they might have been. Here you are so rich, one-tenth of one percent which you wouldn't even notice if you had a sloppy bookkeeping error. The five of us first guys, that'd be a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. and of course, I never heard back from her. But um, um, when, when Gary and I and Brian went to see Star Wars, the, when it came out, the funny thing about Lake Geneva, that little theater got stuff just as soon as Chicago or Milwaukee did. I don't know how they did it. Probably because of the people that summered there, they had clout. But we decided to take an afternoon off. Well, that was rare as all get out. We are going to go see this new movie that we'd heard some buzz about. And we went in and we watched the movie and we were just gobsmacked like everybody else. And Brian, we come out and Brian goes, boy, that's going to be a lot of good for Traveler. We need science fiction. And that's how we ended up with crap like Star Probe and some of those really awful ones because Brian was convinced we were going to cash in on the science fiction craze. But we did know that day that society had taken a sea change because we just knew people were going to flock to that movie simply for effects that had never been seen before. The fact that it was science and future and half-naked princesses and big ugly slug things, you know, that, was, that could have all been some fantasy. But we walked out there, literally the three of us, hands in our pocket, walking back up Main Street going, it's not going to be the same. And it wasn't. That was one more thing in that, in that evolution of public acceptance of, uh, of um, anything that wasn't nonfiction. <laughs> um, we saw that. We jumped onto it. Um, we were very lucky in that we came to a confluence of social and cultural things going on. We were there at that time. Um, Tolkien had taken the colleges by storm because of bootleg copies of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Ring. Everybody was reading The Hobbit. Of course, it was the 70s, you know, flower power, smoke some dope, and um, people were more open 
literally to looking at new things, and along comes D and D. We were, I will say this: we were probably a a product of those strings. I won't say that we saw this stuff coming together and jumped in on it, because that would be a honking big lie. My nose would go through the projection booth. Um, we were we were fortunate, but that's how you do these things. You're the guy that's there when something is available, and we saw it and we ran with it. Um, we we grew viral marketing before it was a electronic buzzword. My, my experience is exactly how D&D &D grew the first two years. Somebody goes to a con, they buy a game, they take it home, they show it to their group. I infected 21 people with D&D. &D. I learned to DM with 15 to 17 players every Saturday, sometimes 20. That's why I don't have problems running huge groups because I have a technique for it. Um, it was a magical time. We hit it right. We saw what we were doing. We applied ourselves. We, we, we scrimped and we saved $100. You know, there was, we could have started paying ourselves more, but then we wouldn't have had enough for the next product or you know, the next project or whatever. And so we bit the bullet. I will say that Oh, maybe a year before I left, year and a half before I left, um, I was making respectable money for a vice president of a division that was making a million dollars a year. I was making today's equivalent of about ninety thousand dollars a year, which you know I, I would have been I'd be happy with that today. <laughs> Looks better in Social Security, um, but um, for a long time we sacrificed putting the money back in the company, putting the money back in the company, not taking it out in salary. And uh, it paid off, you know. Um, I'm still surprised that people uh, know who I am. Uh, occasionally I'd get a student who'd come, come into class and go, my dad wants to know if you're that cask, because his dad played. And so then I signed dad's books for him at school the next day or whatever. It's incredibly gratifying. My wife asked me, you know, she, she doesn't come to cons very often. Occasionally she comes to the one down in Texas because our son lives down there. And uh, she came one year, and as we were trying to get out, the, the normal thing, oh, would you, can I have a picture, would you sign? And, and I always, the greatest present you can give me is to tell me that my signature is important enough for you to overcome your speaking to a stranger. That is the most amazing gift you can give me. And she asked me, oh, oh you take pictures, you sign things? I said, why don't I? Well, because if that person valued my signature and that old beat up book so much that they carried it halfway across the country in their suitcase, a minute of my life is going to give them something they're going to talk about several times over the remainder of their life. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Um, I find it very gratifying that, you know, people think that, you know, what we did was so great and now people are beginning to realize just how much of a finger I had in it because um, I never told anybody because I didn't. I was raised not to brag, you know. I was raised good Catholic. Don't brag. Catholics don't brag. Because that was just the first eight years of school. I got to public school and found out all the lies they had, all the stuff they hadn't told me. I was a little upset and a whole lot less Catholic by the time I graduated. But in any event, I, you know, you don't brag. I don't walk around bragging about what I did. Um, most of the world doesn't give a damn. <laughs> you know, and, and my my grandkids are saying, "But well, you're." Grandpa, I said, no. Only you only see me at these conventions where it's the thin slice of the people that actually play these games. Some of them know who I am. That's not real fame, you know. And I and I use m what my children and my grandchildren and my children have noticed, you know, what they've picked on. A, I said, yeah, okay, a very thin slice of America. Some of them know who I am, and a few of them actually think that what I did a long time ago was cool. I said, but in the 300 and however many million people we got here, most of them are going to go, who? I said, it's all relative. Um, the fact that it's in something I love, something that I've done for over 50 years, that makes it cool. If you were to ask me what was the neatest thing I've ever done, I'm going to have a brass, a brass plaque over a door in a museum in Southern California with my name on it for having donated everything that's going in it. 
That to me is a legacy. My name on a plaque in a museum. The history teacher's hairs rise on his arms when he thinks about that. But hey, somebody says, hey, you're one of those guys that did that? You bet I am. No, didn't always be that way. Couldn't always be that way. Sometimes you go, yeah, you know, <laughs> what do you have against it? You know, yeah. Nowadays, I'm old enough, I don't give a damn. Yeah, I did. Like it? Good. Didn't? Okay. Don't bother me. I still play od and I still board game. I have um, buddies that I board game with twice a month that I've been playing with since 81. Not the whole time, because they kind of stopped and had kids and stuff along the way, but I've stayed in touch with them all the time. Uh, we board game twice a month. And uh, I won't, I don't run, I had a face-to-face -face at home for a while. And uh, I ended up with a couple of 3.5 or 4s in there that really ruined the game. And so when I got an, ex an excuse to suspend the campaign, I did, and I never picked it back up. <laughs> um, what else you want to know about the first five years of TSR? Um, yeah. Um, so you, you had that uh, period where there was the reaction from some of the more extreme religious people uh, against things. Did that, did those reactions ever affect decisions on what you put in the magazine or? No, no. Again, Gary completely, God love him, trusted my judgment. And he knew that I wasn't going to put, he, he just knew that I wasn't going to put anything in that he was going to find a lot of objection to. His uh, response to those religion people were, if you think all this is real, go try spending the gold. All right? And, and, and <laughs> I mean, that, that's his quote, not mine. Um, yes, I dealt with a lot of the religious crazies um, when it was that period of our history when it was, I'm the one dealing with the letters. Um, but did it ever change anything? No. Um, the cover on Eldritch Wizardry nearly killed the brand. <laughs> and the irony on that is, that was drawn by a 15-year-old girl who I met 30 years later. Um, and uh, there were no nipples or anything showing. It was a suggestion of a naked woman lying across an altar or a couch or something. And mom and pop hobby shops were sending them back on open. We can't sell this. We can't sell this. We had a Gen Con at Playboy Club. When it was a Playboy Club, that nearly killed Gen Con. So maybe we should have thought twice about a couple of the things we didn't do or did do. Um, we didn't realize at the time how many uh, Gen Con attendees were young men being brought in from Milwaukee, Chicago, or whatever for the day by their parents. Well, their parents weren't going to bring them to the Playboy Club because apparently they thought that we had bunnies running around serving their kids drinks, which it, it was so wrong because we were in a totally we were in, well, th these wings are all different. We were completely as far away from the bar area as you could get. But it nearly killed the brand. So no, we didn't think about that so much. <laughs> Maybe we should have. But we're in the middle of the sexual revolution. You know, was the late 70s was, was the sexual revolution. So, gee, the suggestion of a naked lady on a... Golly, and I mean, it, it was only her boobs that were suggested naked because there was a, something across her, her crotch. You know, like a, 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 a drape or something. Um, as it was, we... It didn't kill us, obviously. <laughs> they couldn't get it at the one store. They found one they could get at because at that point in time, we had such a draw that if they were a TSR fan, they would go to they would get it by hook or by crook. And so if mom and pop shop didn't get it, they'd order it direct or whatever. But uh, we were aware of the fact that it was a sexual revolution, but we were, Gary was a little prudish, a little more prudish. I'm a little prudish in, in public like that. I, I, my campaigns have never gotten into anything but the occasional dirty joke. Um, we skirted away from that, mainly because we couldn't see why anybody would think that, because we didn't think that, and who would do that? And again, that was our naive, naive, that was our naivete and our hubris, that if we hadn't thought of it, you know, a part of it, because we didn't know any better. But uh, no, that was, that was it. Um, didn't, didn't kill the brand. We survived. Far from it. No. Well, again, that one didn't sell more. There weren't any little 16 year old boys. They, they were looking for girly pictures. They were going to Playboy or Penthouse. They weren't looking for, oh, who was, you know, have nipples. <laughs> yeah, that's what they're, they're looking for. And, uh, oh, um, when we did the succubus, oh, yeah, we heard about that one. Because <laughs> we didn't really do sexy art until about that period of time. We just didn't. 
it wasn't there. You know, they were, everybody was copying comic book art or trying to do their own thing, you know, but the sexy art wasn't, sexy, sexy and fantasy was nowhere except on the occasional fantasy paper book cover. And that was, that was it. There was no sex and fantasy back then, um, not on the general trade publications or whatever. Weren't they also objecting to some of the things they interpreted to be linked to a cult? Oh, yeah. If we have spells, we must be conjuring. Well, Gary would invite them to read any spell out of the book and see if it worked for them. Because there's no words in there. There's nothing. It just explains what the spell does. There's nothing in there on how to make that happen. You get these crazy housewives, and uh, there were several mothers that led all this stuff. What I really resented was the mothers of the kids that hurt themselves blaming D&D &D for it when they were shit parents to begin with. Because I've seen two of those women that made big splashes, just like the Egbert case. They weren't model parents to begin with. You can't blame D&D &D because you raised a, a kid with a brain defect or, you know, doesn't think right. Um, you know, I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> where, where were we? <laughs> um, where, what were we talking about before I went off on a tangent? <laughs> okay. Okay. Ah, uh, that's a terrible idea. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, I, you, before you talked about like having to sort of like censor, cer not really censor, but like discourage certain materials. Oh yeah. But um, I'm I was curious, like what things that were people were creating at that time? Did you think were really creative, really innovative, or anything like that? Well, um, Dennis's star has the. Uh, um, or Sistare, the guy who did Bunnies and Burrows, has a distinction of the only person that gave us a completely, what we consider correct, new class, and we published it straight out, the Druids. Okay. We didn't do damn thing to the Druids. Dennis said that was over the, trans, over the transom. I read this thing, and I said, my God, this is brilliant. And I took it into Gary. I said, Gary, you wouldn't believe what's in because Gary and I were both kind of into Druids anyway. And he says, we'll make this canon. Of course, we didn't use that word then. That's kind of a snotty word. But, you know, he essentially said, we'll make this canon. And I published it. I believe in the magazine. Um, we, we get neat ideas for tricks and traps, but a lot of the time, we didn't want to look at other people's stuff so that nobody could say, you stole this from me. We could go in and stick our hand in the stone lion's mouth and say, no, I didn't. You know, deep in your heart, no, I didn't. Um, I believe in the concept of parallel development. I'm not so egotistical that I'm, I can say that I can have an idea and nobody else could possibly think of it. We, uh, we kind of went along those, those lines. Um, we didn't take much except from friends. Um, and that was generally in the circle of TSR and Greyhawk and us and, and whatever. Um, there's, you know, Dennis and the Druids is clearly the exception. Steve Marsh is another one that did a lot of stuff early on. Um, and, um, it was so right on that it got altered, if at all, very little, um, yeah, because Steve Marsh invented the Sahagan that I stuck into Blackmore because he had the frog thing. He invented the Sahagan, and they went in pretty much untouched. When I say pretty much untouched, it usually means nothing more than spelling or punctuation, you know, light editing. Um, most of the time, we came up with it ourselves. I mean, who's a better idea? You know, and... When you, again, when you can stick your hand in the lion's mouth and say, I thought of that myself, it's as pure as it gets. Yeah. And it's not, not like we didn't steal every trope we could find. Um, in my Fifty Shades of Pork thing is an example of what we used to do. I had Porky Pig in there. I had Rapunzel. I had Shrek. Um, I had um, Daffy Duck. Um, I, you know, I just stole, you know, I didn't name them that. The talking pig in pants. Well, Porky wears a shirt. Mine wore, you know. So we, we stole tropes. That's why we love Fritz. 
Fritz Leiber and, and Harry Fisher and Elspreg DeCamp and Lynn Carter, uh, Paul Anderson, that's where all our first stuff came from. Stealing ideas from published authors. Um, we, none of us were that brilliant at that time to come up with that stuff. Or we'd have been a published author. Okay, but we weren't. So um, most of what we admired the best, we stole and converted and put it into the next supplement. <laughs> It's the best way I can answer that. Very little came in over the transom. Very little that came in over the transom ended up being canon. Yes? You uh, made mention of a kind of a reactionary thing when you guys were like, oh, these guys can publish a board game. Huh? Well, then putting Tom Wom stuff in. Were there other instances like that where you guys were like, oh, so they think they're a company now or they think they're pretty great. Here we go. No. No. We, we just... We, being me, Brian, and Gary, we wanted TSR to be an all kinds of game company. And William the Conqueror 1066 is a game that I worked my butt off on. I still think that is a brilliant game. It was the first melding of miniatures and boards. Round counters, big uh, hexes, brilliant game. It sat there like a turd in the sun. And. Today, go try and find one on eBay, $200, $150, brilliant game. But it wasn't fantasy. Didn't matter whether I put the article in Dragon or Little Wars, it still didn't sell because it wasn't fantasy. Um, they did a couple of games that I wouldn't have voted for had it had been on it. The, um, the Lankmar game did okay. The Dungeon game's still doing well. Um, we did something called, that was based on the old Roman Lattice Latriculorum. It's a spatial reference type thing. I thought that was an idiot game, but Gary wanted to do it because it was an old Roman classic or something, and we had some money, I guess. I don't know. Um, Brian did a bunch of idiot things, too, because we had the money, or it was his turn to do an idiot thing. Um, <laughs> So, I um, mean, that's kind of the way it worked. That's how, that's how Gary did a supplement, so Black, uh, Arneson gets a supplement. And Arneson got a supplement, so Brian gets, you know, Boot Hill or some stupid thing, you know. And he had to, you know, the partners had to keep each other happy. So, uh, yeah, some bad shit got published as a result of that agreement. But I'm trying to think of some others. We didn't start doing well with board games until we did stuff like Snits and off of green things because then we had convinced people that we were a fun company, not necessarily just fantasy. Um, we did a game, oh, bad choice. We got in, we got in bed with Jedco, a uh, game company in Australia. They had several good designs and we were gonna pick one of their designs and uh, publish it, get the rights to it in this country. And I made recommendations uh, for their game called Field Marshal. Brilliant design. No, they decided they were going to go head-to-head -head with Africa Corps. An Avalon Hill classic that still had 72 people sign up for the tournament every con you went to. I mean, it was a staple of the tournament field. It was an okay game. I think we called it African Campaign. It killed us for historical games from then on. Partly was... We were in such a hurry, they were in such a hurry to get it to Origins that uh, they didn't let the boards cure. And so before the con was over, people were coming back with delaminated boards. So about half of what we took with fell apart. The reputation got out. It's a piece of crap. Well, I didn't think it was that good a game anyway, but it wasn't nearly as good as Field Marshal. Um, so that was a failure, but that was, um, that was sloppy production. But we just never really did good. Um, Divine Right, great game, fantastic. Not real. Um, so that's, um, we just got branded with that. Not that it's a bad thing, but it was frustrating because I was a, the big, dirty, deep, dark secret in the first five years of TSR is that Dave Trampian and I were in our, my basement almost every weekend playing tanks. All right, the greatest fantasy artist of this time, and me, the editor of Dragon Magazine, and we're playing micro armor on my sand table in the basement. And if we're not doing that, we're racing little HO slot cars and breaking them against the concrete walls when they went off the track. That was the dirty secret at TSR. 
Yeah, they, they, people thought we lived on a mountain and ate, ate ambrosia and wrote rules with our fingers in the stone. And uh, yeah, no, uh, Dave and I are down in the basement. I got bagpipe music on in the other room and we're shooting at each other with tanks. Um, we were frustrated gamers, not fantasists, gamers. So we had to satisfy just playing. You know, Gary, look at Gary. He did uh, Alexander the Great. He, you know, he did a couple of great board games. But uh, we couldn't even sell it. We couldn't have sold Alexander the Great if we'd had the title to it at the time for Babylon Hill because it wasn't D and D. It wasn't fantasy. Brilliant game. You guys kind of got pigeonholed then at that point. Well, yeah, it wasn't fatal as it often is because we were riding the crest of a wave that we created. But yeah, we were we were pigeonholed. Absolutely. All right. No, don't don't be shy. I got. 15 more minutes I'm responsible for here. Nope, nine minutes. Okay. Who's going to eat some pie, damn it? Come on. Have some pie. All right. What? Okay. What? Curious, you know, when, when things really started taking off and you guys sit in your stride, what was what was the atmosphere like, you know, from going from starting off to, you know, a couple guys in Gary's basement to when you guys really had a hit on your hand? Well, we knew by about by, by 77 that, that the rocket wasn't going to run out of fuel anytime soon. Well, literally, it was the difference between going down into the basement with two 60-watt light bulbs hanging from cords or going into our lovely gray house that my office is here and Gary's is there and the hobby shop's downstairs. It was that kind of a difference. We're doing something. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. You know, We're making progress, and we're having a hell of a lot of fun doing it because you've got to remember we're still all gamers. We go to cons. Whoever wasn't stuck working the booth was running tournaments. You know, we were still running games and doing all that stuff. You weren't working the booth. Well, I started getting my own booth, so I didn't have to do it anymore because I didn't have any employees to run it for me. So I could just sit on my ass behind my table all day. <laughs> Worked out too. Um, it, it was it was that kind of a difference. It wasn't an overnight thing, but I think as we noticed everybody's a little lighter in their step, maybe whistling a little, coming into work, and then one day it was like that. It, it, I'll give you a classic example or case example in my case. I knew that we'd done a lot of things. Okay, collectively I know that what we did has made a lot of influence. It came to me like a big sack of rice over the back of your head as I was sitting in the second. Lord of the Rings movie. And I'm looking at this, and now, oh man, and it just came over me. We caused this to happen. We lit the powder trail that started this. Those books that J.K. Rowling sold were mostly to old D&Ds for their kids. You know, um, we're, you know, look at Sci-Fi Channel and, and, and some of the stuff that's on there. Look at Vikings. I mean, shit, would you think they could have sold Vikings, you know, as if it wasn't for all us guys? Yeah, you know, can't have Game of Thrones, I'll take Vikings, you know. Um, we have changed popular culture. Did we think we were doing that? No. No! We're having a good time hoping the check cleared, you know, hoping that nobody screwed up the reservations at Origins or whatever, you know. We're just having a good time. Um, we, we believed in what we were doing. We knew that we were, if we weren't in it yet, that tall cotton wasn't far away. And, um, you know, tall cotton being a relative, <laughs> relative term. Um, we, we were having fun. And then it started, then it started getting ugly. That's when the blooms and the Gygaxes and the stock split. And, and I, part of the reason I was glad to go when I did I had the tiebreaker in the stocks. The Gygax families owned so much, and the Bloom families owned so much, and I was the only one that had stock that wasn't one or the other. And so very often when it came down to a vote, um, more often than not, I sided with Gary because we were the creative guys. And so more often than not, what he said made more sense to me. And so... As that kept going on and on and on, I was just uh, working up a big grudge factor with the Blooms. I was the first one to get shoved out the door because I was a Gary supporter, Gary crony. And over the next four or five years, all the rest of them got shoved out the door. The Blooms took over and ran the toilet and ran the company into the toilet. End of story. Well, there it was. So, uh, yeah, the creative people, you know, they, they threw Gary out. 
nearly died, brought Gary back in, he revives the company, threw him out again. After the three of us, well, after Gary and I, well, this is kind of egotistical, not after just me, but I was the writing on the wall that, that, that it, things were not going to be remain good there. And uh, once they shoved me out, well, then my stock went back into the pool and Blooms bought it right away. And that's when they started shoving Gary out the door. So it's what happens when lots of money think they, it wasn't like we were making a buttload of money at that time either. And we certainly weren't making as much as the Blooms seemed to think we were when they started making all those expenditures. But that's what happens when you come up out of the basement and move into a real building. The metaphor works because we, we went to the house and then they, we bought the hotel on the corner and the, all their offices were up there. I kept the house as my offices. Uh, once the hobby shop had been transferred down, I moved my offices downstairs. I had artists and their wives and girlfriends living in my upstairs for a while. Then we'd hire them and they'd stay up in my place for a while until they found a place. I think Dee and Otis both bunked in my building for a while. Um, so... You know, there were there was definite signs of progression. Um, then uh, the knives came out, and quite frankly, I just wasn't willing to sit there, and I, I just I got I'd gotten sick of it. You know, I'd gotten sick, and about that time, um, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. They offered me a, um, you know, do this or do that, and I said, screw you, I'm not doing either. Um, and uh, then shortly thereafter, the guys at Ralph Partha approached me, and I moved to Cincinnati and started adventure gaming, but. Um, Though I, I was, my ouster was the beginning of the end. I was the first one, the first one of Gary's confidants to get shoved out the door. So it is what it is, and it's water under the bridge, and it's not worth being bitter about anymore. Now I just write my adventures, and I uh, play poker online for fun, and uh, I still play Age of Wonders. I, that's a PC game that I absolutely love. I still play it. Um, now I, I talked to J.D. Webster last year, the guy that did Phineas Fingers. So I'm, st I'm, I'm you know, sort of in touch with him. I see Diesel at three, four times a year, uh, David LaForce. Uh, I see him three, four. Yeah, yeah, that's how you find his stuff on my mastheads is as, as David LaForce, not Diesel. He wasn't Diesel then. DSL became Diesel. Um, Yeah, I'm. I'm still. I'm still in touch with a few. Mike. Mike and I spent some. Mike Carr and I spent some quality time. He's one of the first five years. Um, he brought in fighting the skies with him, and we did well. That I gotta say, the only game we a historical game that we really did well with was fighting the skies, and that's because Mike bought a, brought us an established product that had a solid base, and we were just able to expand that base for him. So that's the only historical game we did well with while I was there. While I was there. Okay. You get how many more? You mentioned um, blue, blue Last question. Okay, the Blue Sky Sessions. Yeah, and I was I was just wondering, were there any giant, crazy ideas that you guys... Oh, I, there probably were, and then we laughed and had another sip of scotch and another puff of the cigar. That's what we did. We went in there to let our... We went in there to undo the spring on the reel of our mind. <laughs> Let the string loose. And then see what came out as we started winding it back up. That's the best metaphor I can get for those sessions. We just kind of went in and went, <laughs> and all the, all, the, all the line ran off the spool. Okay, let's see what's there. And we go back. We, sometimes it wasn't even about gaming. I can remember sitting in there one time, yeah, you know, one day we'll have a print run of 3,000. And we laughed! our butts off within a year our print runs were sixth each book you know i mean that's what we would do we would go in and we we kind of fantasized planned uh it, it wouldn't be cool if we could do this well let's see if we can at some point that's was that was gary's and my blue sky sessions we just go in and yarn and sometimes they weren't at all about gaming sometimes it'd be about an author or something or a movie we'd seen or did you you know it was just a time when the two of us wrung out the sponges together, and, and, and then after that was over, went the next day back to work, you know, whatever. Um, we had lots of ideas that were preposterous. 
uh, and, th and therefore dismissed. Um, it's where we thought up the modules, uh, doing the G series, and we, that came out of a Blue Sky session. We were looking at how can we address this issue because we made so much money on tournaments, so much money. Um, you know, for us, <laughs> at peanuts today, I'm sure. But uh, so that's that's where the modules came from, out of a blue sky session. Um, we probably, well, there was probably a moment or two during those seven days when we both just kind of walked to the window, uh, away from the desks, and blue skied a little, maybe just as a, 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 a wash of the blackboard type exercise, you know. Um, but we, we talked about um, um, what it would be like to go to the toy show you know, the, and be a part of the industry. And from that came the castles, the castle displays that you, you, they used to do at the toy shows and then later took to Origins and Gen Con and that. Some of those came out of those. Um, sometimes it was, go oh, God, what am I going to do with my daughter? You know, because we, we were both dads, you know, so sometimes that's what it was. Um, it was just our time our time and um, sometimes we sit there for 10 minutes and not say a word because we, we could hear all the crap going on he had a little tiny study a little tiny study we could hear all that crap going on out there but we were secure in his study with our crappy cigars and decent scotch and the window open so we, so Mary went high and put those things out <laughs> great lady his first wife second wife's a harridan that's the nicest thing I can say for recording. Anything else, gentlemen? Because I've just about run out of anecdotes, unless you have a specific question. It is 2 o'clock. Yes. Last question. All right. What would you say is the one thing you did right back in those days, and what is the one thing that you did wrong that you wish you could change? Considering where I'm at now, and the, the pleasure I feel in my situation now, I don't know that there's something I'd go back Except perhaps I don't know if I ought to say this. Just go back and beat the shit out of Kevin Bloom on the day that I got pushed out the door. I would go back and beat the shit out of him. I have told people today that if I see him across four four lanes of high, of highway, I will cross all four lanes to hit him and claim I lost control. That's what I would change because I've held a bitterness for that little slimy bastard all these years. What did I do right? I went to work for Gary and had a goddamn hell of a time that's given me this now 40 years later, sitting here with a bunch of strangers just talking about old times that you find interesting and I find just old times. I, you know, The second best thing I did was go back to school and teach for a while. But anything else? Pie, please, don't let this pie go to waste, please. It's, I told you the story of how I get this pie, you know, for something I did wonderful a long time ago. Please. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for coming and asking. Thanks. <laughs>